Dear students, today's session is about answer writing. The prelims examination, that is the first stage in civil services examination, is MCQ based. In that examination, you do not need answer writing skill in any way because you have to select the best among the available four options. You have to just fill the option in your OMR sheet. The pattern in main examination is entirely different. The main examination is subjective type. Your knowledge in main examination has to reflect in the form of your answers on answer sheet. Irrespective of the amount of knowledge that you have about the subject, you cannot get marks till the time you do not write very high quality answers. I have encountered many students, those who know subject almost everything, they have read many books, they remember each and every point, but when it comes to answer writing, they falter repeatedly. So today's session will help you in understanding the demands of question, how to pick up the points, what should be your language, how to make your answer better among the available candidates, how to use charts, diagrams, your maps, etc. Because your answer has to be better than others, your answer has to be the best answer. If you have the best answer, then only you can see that you are the best among the available lot, then you deserve to succeed in civil service examination. So let us start this session on answer writing. Answer writing is required for your optional. Today's class will focus on history optional. And answer writing is also required for your GS and SC. In this session, I'll focus on history related issues of GS also. And if you can comprehend that, if you can adapt that, then you can apply the same tricks and techniques in essay as well as in the answers belonging to other subjects in general studies. So this session is about answer writing of history because your focus will be on optional as well as on the history component of general studies. But the techniques that you learn today will be helpful in other subjects of GS as well as in essay writing. When you start learning about answer writing, you must understand the pattern of examination, the pattern of question papers. In history optional, you have two papers. The paper one consists of ancient India. and medieval India. So medieval India or medieval India and ancient India, these are two parts of paper one. In paper two, you have modern India and world history. Every paper has two sections, section A and section B. So here, ancient India constitutes section A and the medieval India constitutes section B. Section A, Section B here also similarly. So this is the first thing that you should know when you start preparing for history optional. Then you should know there are four sections. There are four components of optional syllabus, ancient, medieval, modern and world history. South India will be part of ancient as well as medieval because Vijayanagar, Bahmani would come here Pallavas, Cholas, Sangam will come here. So question could be in any of the parts. So this is the first step in learning the 
answer writing skills. What time kind of questions are asked? Before moving to the type of questions, let us see one more step here. In ancient India, you have four questions. Question number one, question number two, question number three, question number four. Medieval India, question number five, question number six, question, oh sorry, yes, question number six, question number seven, and question number eight. Similar is the pattern for, for paper two, one to four, section A, five to eight, section B. The first question in ancient India is map based. What is the map based question? I will explain in detail after a few minutes. Question number two has three parts. Question number three has three parts. Question number four has three parts. Similarly, there are three parts in question number six, question number seven, question number eight. Question number five has five parts. So here five does not have three parts here. There are five parts. In paper two, the question number one has similar five parts. Question number five has similar five parts. Mentioned as A, B, C, D, and E. Similar is the nomenclature here. In map based questions, there are 20 subparts. 2, and this goes up to 20. Question number 6, 7, 8 in paper 2. Question number 2, 3, 4 in paper 2. They also have three parts each. So this is the further breakdown. Now let us see the marking. Every paper here, whether paper one, whether paper two, the paper is of 250 marks. Every paper has eight questions. Out of these eight questions, five questions have to be answered. This you have to listen carefully, you have to understand carefully because every time when I see the test series students, those who have completed their preparation of subject, many of them even have written means once or twice, they do not really understand which five questions are to be attempted. So at times they end up attempting some parts from here, let's say suppose two, there are three parts, A, B and C, similarly there are three parts here. So they pick up A from here, B, C from here, and they think that I have done one paper question. That's not the way. So you have to understand carefully the pattern. So five questions have to be answered. Some are compulsory. Question number one and question number five are compulsory. 
you have no choice but to attempt them. It means out of five, two are done. To attempt the remaining three questions, you have to pick up at least one from each section. So there are section or two sections here. So from each section you have to pick up at least one question. Look at here. So one from section A over and above question number one. One from section B over and above question number five. Now for example if you decide to attempt let's say question number two here and question number seven here. Any question you can attempt that's not a problem. You have sorted out four. One, two, five, seven. You have to attempt five out of the eight questions. The question number five or the fifth question you can pick up from any of the sections. So fifth question can be from any of the sections. This could be from section A or section B. Now which should be the target? In paper one, ancient India is more scoring than medieval India. Ancient India is relatively difficult than medieval India. In paper two, world history is relatively difficult, relatively more scoring than modern India. So when you start your preparation, you need to focus more on ancient India in paper one and more on world history in paper two because these are difficult areas. Questions from these sections are going to be attempted by less number of students. So it means you are going to have less competitive analysis or less comparison will be there in the mind of the examiner it means you are likely to score better marks. So you have to invest full energy in medieval also. I'm not saying you leave modern also. You have to devote full energy. But if we have to say which one should be focused more, ancient should be focused more, and the world history should be focused more in paper two. So when you attempt any question, you have to attempt all the parts here. Question number one, say compulsory 20 parts. All the 20 parts you have to attempt, then only you'll get marks out of 50. There are 250 marks. And these five questions carry 250 marks. It means 5 into 50. Every question is of 250 uh, 50 marks, so total you get 250 marks out of which you need to score. So every question carries 50 marks. How are these marks divided? In ancient and medieval portions or paper one, the marks are divided or the questions are 15 plus 15 plus 20. So three subparts 15 15 20 15 15 20 15 15 20 similarly here 15 15 20 so in paper one the division of marks are like 15 15 20 there are two questions for 15 marks or two parts of 15 marks and one part of 20 marks in every question question number two to question number four here question number three to question number eight here in question number five in paper one you have five questions carrying 10 marks each. So there are five parts, all the five parts are compulsory. Every part carries 10 marks. Similar is the system in question number one of paper two and question number five of paper two. So all these five subparts are having 10 marks each.
that is how you make 50. The pattern for question number 2, question number 3, question number 4, 6, 7, 8 in paper 2 is a little different. Let us see that pattern also. Here, the three subparts A, B, and C have 20, 20, and 10 marks. So it's not 15, 15, 20, it is 20, 20, 10. So 20, 20, 10 for 2, same for 3, same for 4, same for 6, 7, 8. 1 and 5 have 5 subparts, every subpart carries 10 marks. So this is a breakdown of your markings for every question. So you have 250 marks in each paper and combined together you have two papers. So optional carries 250 into 2, 500 marks. This is what you have on the table. Now how much is a good score? How much is a safe score? That also you should have in your mind. My students have scored repeatedly between 310 to 340. So there are students, those who get 340. There are students, those who get 310. 320s, there are many, there are 330s, there are many. Average scoring in history optional is around 280 to 290. This is what an average student scores. Average means somebody who has prepared well, but is not the best prepared, is not the best practiced candidate. Your target has to be something around 310 to 320. On a good day, you should reach 340, 350. On a bad day, you should not go below 290. So 290 has to be your minimum target that I should not fall below it. And you should target something around 330 on a good day. So 290, 330, this is a comfortable band. Anything above 330 is a bonus. Anything below 290 is going to be occurs, it's going to pull you down very, very badly. So, you are trying to score something around 65 to 70 percent. A student's score, sometimes in paper 1, sometimes in paper 2, somebody in paper 1, somebody in paper 2, 175, even 180 marks. One of my students earlier scored 70 percent marks, average 350 out of 500. So if somebody is getting 70 percent average, it means person might have scored 90 on some questions, person might have scored 40 on some other questions. So you cannot have the same percentage of marks for every answer. Some answers are going to be very good, some answers are going to be average, some answers are going to be below average. So somebody whose average score is 70 percent, you can understand that person might have reached 80, 85, 90 on some of the answers. It means your answers have to be the best. Don't think that okay 70 percent is good enough, 55 percent marks are scored by the topper overall including GSSC and interview. So you cannot say, no, I will get only 55% and that's good enough, I can get any time. That's in the case, 55% here means 100%. So when you target 65% or 70%, 80%, you have to write for 100%. You have to write the best answer, then you can reach 70%. To get 70%, I'm repeating, again, you have to have 90% marks on some questions which are possible. It's not that in history you cannot get 90%. If you do not get 90% marks, you can never have 70% average. And I have many candidates over the period of time, those who have scored 70, 72, 73% also at an average in both the papers. And in some papers they have scored even 80%, suppose 
80% in paper two or sometimes 80% paper one, it means they would have a score 90% on some of the questions at least. It means UPSC gives marks quite liberally. It's not that okay, this is history, this is humanities, you cannot get good score. Of course, you cannot get 100%, and 100% is nowhere, because in subjects like mathematics, subjects like physics, where 100% marking is possible, UPSC puts a very, very heavy negative ceiling. So there is a kind of system of balancing the marks. Science subjects face negative ceiling. Humanities face either neutral or positive ceiling. So that also you have to keep in mind that if somebody scores 500 out of 500 in mathematics, that is practically possible. And the history wala scores something around 320, so that 500 would be brought down, would be put to the level of 320. So every subject is put at par, finally. So if you have a negative ceiling in that, in science subject, that's why people in science subject, they score very low. Somebody will get 400, will end up reaching 220 through that negative compensation. So you should focus on scoring 100% marks on the questions you write. You have to write the best answers. You have to remember that means examination is the real test of your personality. Means examination is the real test of your knowledge. And if you missed somehow, then you have to go back to the prelims again, which you have qualified this year. And next year, nobody knows whether you will crack PT or not. So once you have the opportunity to write main exam, you have to put your best effort. You have to ensure that you get best marks. And best marks, you have to calculate, see how many questions are there, which you have to attempt. 20 here, 20 subparts, plus 5 here, 25 nine subparts for the other three questions. So 25 plus nine, 34 in paper one. 10 plus nine, 19 in paper two. So even if you remove these 22, let's say make them five, like question number five, question number one, question number five there. So five, five, 10 plus 19, sorry, nine, 19. You have 10 plus nine, 19, 19 plus 19, 38 questions. So you have 38 questions at your disposal. Now try to score half mark extra on every question, which is not a very difficult task. Half mark you can get extra just by writing few points, by in incorporating few maps, few charts, by underlining the keywords, by making your language slightly more effective. Half mark. And half everywhere means you are getting 19 marks more than what you would have got earlier in optional. Similarly, there are 20 questions on in GS paper, in each paper, and there are subparts there also. So 20 into 4, 80, and you have subparts, you'll have around 120 parts, subparts in GS. Target half mark, you'll end up getting 60 to so 70 marks extra. And 60 to 70 marks is not the difference between the person who gets the last rank in merit list and somebody who gets the first rank. Almost everyone will be covered in these 60 to 70 marks. So when you write answers, you have to see that, try to incorporate everything that you know, try to meet every demand of the question, because if you get half mark here, half mark in the next question, half mark in the next, you may end up getting 60, 70 marks more. So fight here is for every mark, every half mark, every quarter mark. You cannot just say, okay, let me write whatever best I can do, and then it's up to UPSC. It's not up to UPSC. Everything is up to you. This is your examination. If you write, UPSC will give you marks. UPSC gives marks very, very liberally. So this is about the pattern of examination. You have two papers. You have section A, section B. Every section has four questions. So all these sub -part parts and three parts here, yes, sub five sub parts you should know. Whenever you attempt a question, it means you are supposed to attempt all the sub parts of that question, then only it is counted. Now somebody says that I will attempt six, I'll attempt seven, I'll attempt all the eight questions. And let UPSC select the five best out of them. UPSC won't select five best out of them, UPSC will accept 
first five questions. So if you have attempted all the eight questions, UPSC will pick up these one, two, three, three, because four you cannot. And then five and six. Question number four, that might be the best, will be cut down. Similarly, question number seven or eight, you might have written the best way. UPSC examiner will simply strike it down. You will not get anything for those answers. So this is the first step in learning how to write the best answer. You must know what is the nature of challenge. And if you understand the challenge, then you can prepare yourself better. You can meet the challenge head on and you can emerge victorious. Now let us see the map based question. Look at what is mentioned here, if you can read it properly. Identify the following places marked on the map supplied to you. Write a short note of about 30 words on each of them. On question come answer booklet. Locational hints are given for the places. Every subpart here is carrying two and a half marks. Two and a half marks, 20 subparts, total 50. Like that you get 20 locational hits. You get these 20 locations marked on the map. Map is of Indian subcontinent. India, Pakistan, Afghanistan, Bangladesh and Myanmar. These are given here. Nepal, Bhutan, all are there. Then you have to identify. For example, if you see any site you can pick up, say here, site number 15 is marked. 15 here says, a political and cultural center. Sorry, ancient capital. This is number 15. Ancient capital. So ancient capital is given here. It means you have to find out what is this ancient capital through map practice. We will conduct map based classes, particularly for these kind of sites. So there are six classes in the plan. In those six classes, we will discuss each and every site and how to identify and how to write the sort of descriptive notes also. So you have to identify through the practice, you will get to know that this is simply Srinagar. And once you have Srinagar, you can write about the description of Srinagar. So this is most scoring because every site has 2.5 marks. And you can get 2.5 out of 2.5. There are 20 sites out of 20, 18 can be done without much difficulty. Everybody who sits in main examination has at least 15 sites with him or her. And with reasonable level of preparation, you can get 18. And if you get 18 into 2.5, so you reach 45 marks. 45 marks, this is 90%. So the shorter is the question, the more scoring it becomes. So in the map question, you should target at least 85 or 90 95 percent of the marks which are very much possible most of the serious candidates they know each and every site so they get full 100 percent marks on the map and here in the classes we'll train you enough we'll give you a lot of practice so that you can get 100 percent marks on the map based question so this is question number one that is part of ancient india here map based 20 subparts. Every site you have to identify, you have to write 30 words about that. And every subpart carries 2.5 marks each. How much to write on your answers or in your answers? Question number one. And question number five, they carry word limits. Look at here. You have to write short descriptive notes in around 30 words, 30 into 20. So limit here is 600. 34 every subpart, total 600. If you write 40, this is going to increase a lot. So you have to write something around 30. So 30 could be 25, 
30 could be 35. It's not that it has to be exactly 30. The language is about. Sometimes the instruction says not more than. So once the instruction says not more than, you have to limit up to that. You should not write more. If you write more, you could be penalized. So when you say about, about you can have 10 percent margin plus minus. That's not going to have any problem for you. How to count the words? That is also a big confusion in the mind of your students. Anything except comma and full stop. So those kind of things you need to leave. If you're writing A, that is one word. If you're writing a continent, continent is one word. If you have a continental revolution, that becomes third word revolution. So is M, R, A, N, the, every letter, every word, this is a word, this is a letter, this is a word also. So every word is going to be counted. So you don't have to have in your mind that A is a very small, is, is a very commonly used was, will not be counted as words. Everything that you write will be counted as one word. Whether the word has 10 or 15 letters or the word has only one letter, that does not make any difference. So every word will be counted. Question number one. In paper one is map based, so there are 20 into 30 words. Question number one in paper two has five parts. Similarly, question number five in paper one and question number five in paper two, these questions have five parts. Here, each and every subpart has a word limit. One fifty words, ten marks. Marks are given. Instructions are given clearly. Sometimes not more than one fifty words. Sometimes in around one fifty words. So you have to read the instructions carefully. Here the word limits are mentioned clearly by UPSC. So here for these questions. 150, 150, 150, 150 here. So total you can see 750 words. But you don't have to worry about 750, you have to count 150 separately because limit is for each and every sub part. There's no word limit for question number 2, 3, 4 or parts of question number 2, 3, 4, parts of 6, 7, 8, similarly 2, 3, 4, 6, 7, 8. They do not carry any word limit explicitly. But you can have an idea how much you should write. So question number two, question number three, question number four, question number six, question number seven, question number eight. These questions have no explicit word limit. By using the scale from question number one, we can have a rough idea how much you should write. Here, 10 marks, 150 words. It means you can calculate that one mark is equal to 15 words. That is the rough approximate scale. So if you have a question of, say, 15 marks, In paper 1, so you can multiply by 15, total number of words, 225. If you have a question of 20 marks, again multiply by 15, total number of words become 300. So there are three types of questions in your history optional. 10 markers, 15 markers, 20 markers. And if you want to include a map, then 30 mark, 30 
words 2.5 markers. So 2.5, mention 30, leave this, this is very small. Otherwise you have 10 markers, you have 15 markers and you have 20 markers. For 15 and 20 markers there is no explicit word limit. But by using this skill from question number 1 and question number 5 you can get the rough idea that examiner is likely to look for these many words. If you write 400 words, there's no problem, you will have no punishment. If you write 200 words out of three, in place of 300, again, you will have no punishment, but you have to meet the demands of your question. In examination, you should not write more, try to write less. Instructions are given on question paper. The instructions say that your answers must be short, crisp, and succinct. So instead of hitting around the bush, your language has to be very direct. That is what is say executive type of language. Executive cannot afford to make stories. You have to give command to your juniors. You have to send reports to your seniors in very, very crisp language, direct to the point in a minimum number of words. So same has to be here. UPSC is basically testing your personality. UPSC is testing your personality in prelims examination. UPSC is testing your personality in main examination from a different dimension. UPSC is testing your personality in interview. There's no interview in UPSC this, that is known as personality test. So everywhere, it is a test of your personality. Of course, personality carries decision making. Personality carries how do you handle the pressure. Personality involves your knowledge, your refinement, your language. Everything is part of personality. So here, your language is important, your clarity of thoughts is very important. If you have understanding, then you can write a big thing in very few words. That is why UPSC wants to know whether you can write the answers in 150 words, you can write answers in 225 words, so 300 words as well as if you have to write short, very, very short, 30 words, can you write about a particular site in 30 words? 30 words cannot be just one sentence. You have to include two, three, four, or five different types of information. So include as many dimensions as possible. Whether question is of 150 words, question is of 300 words, you have to include every possible dimension. Only difference is going to be that of explanation. You need to cut down explanation if question is of sort type. You need to add slightly more explanation, slightly more details, slightly more facts if question has more number of words to be written or you have more freedom in terms of the number of words. So this is about how much you should write. Now something about the speed also. Try to count how many words you need to write in paper one. of your optional. Let us start question wise. Question number one has 30 words into 20 questions, so 600 words. Question number two, question number three, question number four, question number six, seven, eight, 50. Marks 15, so 750 each, and 750 each, you have to pick up three out of them because one and five are compulsory. So three means 73 to 21, 22, 50. Then you have question number five. Question number five has five subparts. So 150 into five, 750. So combine together, add them 3,000 and 600, 3,600. So 3,600 words like this you have to plan. You must know how many words you need to write in three hours. Three hours, 
it means you have 180 minutes at your disposal. Out of these 180 minutes, you have to underline, you have to make maps, you have to include charts, you have to make tables sometimes, you have to read the question, and you have to make format, you have to think about the answer. So, out of these 180 minutes, at least 20 minutes you have to leave aside for those kind of things. You have to read, you may have to drink water, you may have to underline, you may you have to include charts, maps, etc. So if you leave 20 minutes, you are left with, let's say, 140 or slightly on conservative side, 130 minutes. So 130 minutes that you should keep, 10 minutes at the last you should have with you so that in case of emergency, you can go through your questions, you can review them. If you need to add some more points here and there, you can add those points. So divide 3600 with 130. So 13, twoza, 26, remaining 10, 100 divided by 13. 13, 7, 91. So around 27, 28 words per minute you have to write. 27 to 28 words per minute. If you have to get average of 27 minutes words per minute, it means your speed has to be something around 40 words per minute. So when you practice answer writing at your home or during test series, during test practice, Always have the watch with you. Always try to see how many words you write in, let's say, 10 minute slot. And then, 10 minute slot, you know that you have to write something around 400 words. That should be the speed here. Because in examination, pressure is more. With pressure, the speed will become slightly less. So, if you have 40 words per minute in speed, that's a good speed. Most of the candidates in the beginning, they have a speed of around just 15 to 20 words and that's why they miss out almost half of the question paper. So you have to calculate every minute, you have to ensure that your speed is good from the very first day, carry a stopwatch, put a stopwatch when you write answer and that stopwatch will tell you how many words you are writing in one minute. That is one thing. Secondly, how to ensure that you are completing your paper because one common problem every candidate faces is that they cannot complete question paper within these three hours. So if you divide 180 minutes by five, five questions you have, you get 36 minutes. 36 minutes you have for every question Leave something for underlining, review, cosmetic improvement. That's a 32 minute every question. When you start your question number, say for example, question number one, then mark the time. Suppose if time is nine o'clock, you start, say 9.32, I will have to stop. So when you start writing your answer, Look at the watch, put the time on cushion paper, and put the time which is going to end. So you don't have to write that much. You can simply say 9.32 or simply 32. It means you have to keep in your mind that 9.32, I have to end my question number one. When you write answers, the first question takes more than one hour. Second question will take 45 minutes. Third question will take 40 minutes and your time is gone. Hardly anything is left out for question number five. So you can write three questions very well. If you push harder, you can write four questions, but fifth question is very, very difficult to manage because for fifth question, hardly 15, 20 minutes are left out. In 15, 20 minutes, you cannot do justice. Even if you know each and every point about the answer, you cannot do justice. So ensure that you put time on the question when you start writing. If question has three parts, 
There are three parts, as we just discussed here. You have 10 markers, you have 15 markers, you have 20 markers. Minute-wise also, we have discussed how many minutes will be there for every mark. That calculation also you should keep in your mind. So how many minutes per mark? You have 20, 250 marks, 180 minutes. Or 36 minutes for 50 marks. So it means every minute you have to cover 1.5 marks. It means if you have 15 marker, it means at the most you have 10 minutes. Leave the margin for reading the question, understanding the demands, making format. So you'll have 8 minutes for 15 markers. You'll have 6 minutes for 10 markers. You'll have 11 minutes for 20 markers. So put those 8 minutes or 6 minutes or 11 minutes here. Okay, 1 a.m. writing. Let me finish at 9, 8. Don't let it cross 9, 10 in any case. And if you do not pay attention, you will end up 9.25 in the first part itself. You write 500 words in one question, which is requiring 150 words, you will not get more. You may end up penalized because question number one, question number five have word limits. So plan properly. This is your life. This is like a war here. The most prepared is going to win. It's not about what you have been doing. You cannot say, no, no, I do not know the rules of the game. It's a matter of training. The difference between the best and the worst is not about birth. It's not about kind of some other fundamental qualities. It's just a matter of training. Somebody who is well-trained will be the best every time, and somebody who is not trained at all will end up being last Almost every time accidents do not happen every day. UPS examination cannot be cracked with the help of just accident or luck. Every human being is lucky. We are human being. It means we are lucky. Had we been unlucky, it would have been ending in some other kind of form. So some say it's not my day or oh, it was a bad luck. If God wants to give you bad luck, God can decimate any of us any time. So God has ensured, God has blessed us all. That's why we are human beings. Do not ever hide your lack of training behind the mask of bad luck. There's nothing like bad luck. It's luck. It's luck. It's always good luck. So plan, prepare, understand the game, and then execute like a kind of surgeon. You have to be precise. You have to be refined. And you have to enjoy the answer writing will require repeated revisions. And when you start writing answer, you put your pen on the answer sheet. Your pen should not stop till the time you reach the last word. If you're stopping your pen, it means you're thinking. You're trying to recall. It means you have not revised. And if you recall, you try to think in examination, you can never complete even three questions. Try that at home while you practice. So ensure that you put the pen and your pen should stop only when answer is over. And if you are stopping pen in between, then go back and revise more. Remember everything. Forget your name. It's okay. Don't forget the point which you need to put in your answer. That is your destiny. That is your destination. Let us move ahead. How to approach answer writing? Some more details here. The first step in answer writing is read question properly. Don't have any prejudgment. Sometimes you read few words and you think that question is the same that you have prepared and you find demands are different. 50% of the effort in UPSC, 50% of the challenge in UPSC examination is about understanding the demands of question. 
So read your question properly. Second step. Identify the demands of question. If you do not identify the demands, like a doctor, if you do not identify the disease, then how will you cure? What kind of medicine will you prescribe? So you have to identify the demands of question. And then next part is a lot words to different demands. Question may have two, three or four different parts. So you have to identify, okay, which part is more important, which part is less important. How much percentage of the words will go to the demand number one? How many percentage will be going to demand number two, demand number three? Every question in UPSC will have at least three or four different demands. It's not going to be just simple one-dimensional answer. You will have so many different demands to meet. So UPSC is going to put you in a complicated situation where you have resources limited, few words, resources limited, you have few minutes and there's a pressure you have to complete it if you don't complete it you are out of the game after loading these things step number four make format make answer format what is format I'll tell you after a few minutes so this is a four step process that you need to see read the question properly Identify the demands, allot percentage of words which you have at your disposal, make format, execute it. How to identify the key demands of question? To identify the key demands of question, look at important words or you say indicative parts of question which are going to reveal look at the prefix suffix or sometimes referred as tail words elucidate explain discuss critically examine justify support substantiate there are more than 40 different varieties we'll discuss all of them one by one today and Underline keywords. So that you focus on those keywords while writing your answer. Use AQ, TQ technique. What is the technique? We'll discuss in the next part. So, read the question properly. Look at important words and phrases or indicative. Say significance. Say impact. Say critical examination. Prefix, suffix, tail words. Pay attention. The tail words or these prefixes and suffixes are going to indicate where you have to invest your time. The language of your answer will be decided by these tail words. Underline keywords and use AQTQ technique to find out more about the dimensions or demands of question. Look at this question here. This is from modern India. So questions I have picked up 
25, 30 different kind of questions from different parts of the syllabus. These questions have been asked by UPSC. Most of these have been asked by UPSC. Few could be new. The moderates emphasize the need for political apprenticeship. So, moderates, the moment you read it, you have to underline moderates. So, we are talking about moderates. If you do not know who are moderates, you cannot understand the demands of question. You cannot understand the question itself. Moderates means we are talking about the early nationalist leaders like Dada Bhai Noroji, Gopal Krishna Gokhale. So, automatically, their photos, their names should come to your mind. Emphasize the need for political apprenticeship. This is indicative portion. Under the providential guidance of British rule. So providential guidance of British rule. It means the first part of the question is talking about the ideology or the approach of moderates. So what you have learned about the moderates or what you are learning about the moderate that should come to you. The extremists rejected the idea of England's providential mission in India as an illusion. So when you read the word extremist here, again you should get the name of Tilak, Lala Lajpat Rai, Bipin Chandra Pal, Aurobindo Ghosh, those kind of nationalist leaders. So they did not have any faith in the idea of vitamins burden. In the British providential mission. Providential mission means the British used to say that we have been directed by God to reach the native land like India and to enlighten people, to guide these native people from darkness to the path of civilized life. So identify these phrases, indicative phrases, indicative words, keywords. Apply AQTQ. What is AQTQ? Full form of AQTQ is asking question to question. A for asking, question to question. So, questions in fact. What kind of questions can you ask? Who are moderates? That's the first thing. So, it means you have to ask yourself, who were moderates? Okay, moderates were those who were liberal, those who believed in constitutional form of agitation, those who believed in petition, prayer, and memorandum. Okay, moderates were Dada Bhai Nauroji, Gopal Krishna Gokhale, M.G. Ranade. That's one question. Who were these? Emphasized on the political apprentice. So what was political apprenticeship? Apprenticeship means training. So you have asked who were moderates. Then ask, what was apprenticeship? That by working with British rule, we'll get the training in administration, in judiciary, in economy. Providential guidance of British rule. So you have to ask, what is the meaning of providential guidance of British rule? So AQTQ, you have to use to find out demands like who, what, when, where, how, all these kind of questions. So, the moment you pick up six, seven, five, four different dimensions, it means you automatically have four or five parts of your answer in your mind automatically, immediately the moment you read the question. So it means if I have to write answer here, then I have to start with the moderates. Moderates were the early nationalist leaders such as Dada Bhai Noroji, Gopal Krishna Gokhale and M.G. Ranade. They were the torch bearers of India's struggle against British rule. What was apprenticeship? Next point come to the issue of apprentice, the moderates were under the impression that British rule was good for India. They believed in the continuation of British rule. They were under the impression that end of the British rule will push India into the phase of darkness of medieval times. Third, so every dimension that you have identified through AQTQ, try to put two to three sentences. If you have an answer of let's say 150 words, how many sentences? 
every sentence will have 8 to 10 or 12 words. So you can see roughly around 12 to 15 sentences. 12 to 15 sentences, that's all you have at your disposal. If you have a kind of answer of 224 words, then you can see something around 18 to 22. 300 words, you have something around 28 to 32 sentences with you. So resources with you in terms of the words are very, very limited. Whenever you read question, most of the time you'll feel that you do not know anything about it. You have only 15, 20 words with you, don't worry. Follow the techniques. You can recall the points that you have read during the preparation. And once you recall the points, you can format, you can write answer easily. So underline the keywords, ask questions to the question, focus on the parts. What are the parts of a good answer? Every answer is supposed to have three main parts. First, introduction. You start with a good introduction. Introduction is telling somebody who you are, from where you are, what do you do. So introduction's task or the role is to connect your answer with the question. If you have to write introduction here, then you'll start with the moderates. Moderates were the early nationalists. Try to use shortest possible sentences or the struggle of India against British rule was started by the leaders like Dada Bhai Noroji, M.G. Ranadi, S.N. Benerji, Gopal Krishna Gokhale. They used a liberal philosophy or the outlook was liberal. That is why they were known as moderates. So start with like a definition. So in simple language, you can understand introduction is like a definition. If question comes about drain of wealth, then define drain of wealth. If question comes about Ashoka, then write about Ashoka. In the history of mankind, a number of great rulers came or sat on throne. The name of Ashoka comes foremost in the list of these great rulers. Anything that comes to you, have 15, 20 different introductions ready made with you. Go to examination with introductions. You have introduction to revolution, you can see. American Revolution was one of the greatest phenomena in the history of mankind. Same thing you can just replace for Russian Revolution or Chinese Revolution or, or French Revolution. French Revolution was one of the greatest phenomena. Questions are going to come from these topics. So go to examination with introduction. Introduction is the most difficult part. First sentence is the most difficult sentence to write. If you go to examination with introduction in your pocket, you won't have to think. You can start first sentence easily. So you know that there are 19 questions in one paper. So go with 25 introductions. Use a different introduction in every question. Make answers very kind of colorful. Have diversity. Poverty is the worst thing that could happen to anybody. Don't behave like a poor fellow in examination that you do not have introduction, you do not have variety. Exhibit variety. Reveal your richness. So introduction is the first part. Second part is the main body. And third part is the conclusion. Conclusion could be a way forward. NGS answers have to end with a positive note. Way forward. What's a better way further? Conclusion could be what you have understood. Conclusion could be agreement that you accept it. Conclusion could be rejection. So let's say question comes about the role of philosophers in French Revolution. So you can 
right at the last that in this way it can be safely concluded that the role of philosophers was important but it was just like that of a catalyst. The criticality of the role was limited. So you agree, you disagree, you accept, you reject, whatever you have comprehended, that is going to be your conclusion. Introduction is like a definition initiating a relationship between the answer and the question. Main body is the real answer. Now divide the number of words for your introduction. Always deal with percentage. 10 to 15 percent of your answer length should be introduction. If you have a question of 150 words, then 15 to 25 words. If you have a question of let's say 300 words, then 30 to 45 words should be an intro. So don't write too much. Two to three sentences, that's it. Connecting answer with the question, making the answer meaningful, starting on a front foot. Same way conclusion should be around 10 to 15 percent. How much you left out? Seventy to eighty percent has to be your main body. And here you need to put all the demands, you need to fulfill all the requirements that question has, all the different dimensions you need to cover here. So all the parts are important. Let's start with a good introduction and with a good effective conclusion. What is answer format? When you have done all these calculations, you know what is introduction, you know what is main body, you know what is conclusion. Then after reading question, after identifying the demands, make a format. Format means jolt down key points. Of your answer. Some answer may have five points. Some answers may have seven points. Somewhere you may have 25 points. So jolt down the key points at the last part of your <coughs> answer somewhere in the rough page on the question which you are not going to attempt while writing at your home while attempting the questions in test series. You can use the rough paper. So note down the main points. So the first point, this will be second point with this, third point with this, fourth point with this. You can recall. If you have, let's say, six minutes for 150 words, invest. 30 to 40 seconds in reading question, in underlining the keywords, identifying demands. Invest 30 to 40 seconds in making format. So even if you have less exhausted 1.5 minutes here, the remaining 4.5 minutes are quite sufficient. Because if you have planned everything, then 40 words per minute is not a big difficulty. And 4.5 minutes, you can write 180 words. So, it's not going to be that difficult. Make a plan. If you have all the points, sometimes what happens, you recall the point at the last, which is supposed to be at the beginning. So, if you write the most important point at the last, your effectiveness will go down. By making the format, you understand, okay, this is important, this is less important, this is most important. Then you can arrange accordingly. And then execute these points in the form of your answer. So by making format, you make your answer more effective. You improve the planning in a big way. This technique of answer formatting will make your answers more connected. The different parts of answers have to be connected. The most important point has to come first. The least important point has to come at the last. So the flow, the smoothness, or you can say interconnectedness. All these are very, very important part of your answer. You have to focus not only on the points 
or the information or the analysis that you put, you also have to ensure that your answer is kind of easy to understand. It's interesting to read. Examiner should not stop in between. If he or she starts reading your answers, they should continue till the last. They should enjoy it. So that flow is very, very important. You can make flow only if you have planned the points, the parts in advance. So answer formatting is important. Initially, you should form it on rough paper or in the beginning of your answer sheet. Later on with practice, you can start formatting in your mind itself. Okay, this is point one, this is point two, this is point three. Okay, now I'll put this point number three as number one. This is most important. You can recall how many points you have learned. So if you are recalling here, let's say seven, and there are 10 points that you have learned during your preparation. So you can invest a few seconds to think, to ponder over what are these three points. While writing answer, you should not think, you should not stop. What do you have to think, what do you have to do? Do it in the beginning. Thereafter, there should be flow, there should be interconnectedness. A smoothness is very, very important. Look at this question here. Contribution of revolutionary extremist movements movement to the success of India's struggle against British rule. So there's no tail word suffix perfix here that I have removed deliberately. So focus is on contribution. So contribution you can think of okay, point number one that is, is spreading awareness into native states. Point number two providing alternative to Indian nationalists who were not happy with peaceful. Point number three providing immediate relief by assassinating the unpopular British officers. Point number four building pressure on mainstream nationalists. So all these points you can recall and you can write briefly in few, few words. And then you can rearrange these points. And then when you write, you will not have problems. Okay, most important point will come first and they will be connect among these different points. So that is the purpose of making answer format. How to make your language effective? To write answers in effective language, you must rely, you must use as much as possible the passive voice format. You have active voice, you have passive voice. So consciously you should use passive voice more frequently than the active voice. Particularly when sentences are small. Let us see how. For example, if you're writing the features of French Revolution or features of American Revolution or features of Enlightenment, let's say for example, Enlightenment, you can say Enlightenment was liberal in nature. That's one way of writing. Second way of writing could be liberalism was one of the most important features of enlightenment. Enlightenment is already mentioned in question. That is a part of question. If you start your every sentence with enlightenment was like this, enlightenment was like that, or American Revolution was a violent, American Revolution was a mass revolution, American Revolution was a liberal revolution, then examiner will get fed up after reading few points. To make it more effective, your first word has to be most important in sentence. First sentence has to be most important sentence in paragraph. First paragraph has to be the most important paragraph in your entire answer. So use the first word as the most important word. For example, if you're writing about the features of social religious reform movements, then you can say assimilatory character. or liberalism, or progressive outlook, or non-violence, or what are the point you pick up, and they have to continue with the sentence. As military character was clearly visible in the activities of Indian socio-religious reform movements. Underline that. If you write assimilatory, if you're writing liberal, underline that. While underlining, you can use a different pen. Color is not necessarily to be different. 
use blue or black. You are not supposed to use any other color except blue and black while writing your answers in examination. A red color pen is for the examiner. Green color pen is always used by the head of the department. So no green color, no red color, no other fancy color. You have to use blue or black color pen in your examination. So if you're using blue for writing, black you can use for underlining. Or maybe a different shade of blue or black can be used for underlining. Underline the keywords because if examiner looks at that one particular word, he or she should get the gist of your answer. They should understand what are you trying to write. They should not get the most important word in the last of the sentence or the most important sentence in the last of the paragraph. Nobody is going to make that much effort for you to find out where are the demands of question in your answer. You have to start with a big hit in the first sentence itself. So that is passive voice. Use passive voice as much as possible. Second thing you need to keep in your mind. Always write answers in third person. Do not use I, you, we. Third person. So without using I, you, don't start your answers with yes or no. Question is saying, do you agree? You start with yes, I agree. That's not the way to write. You have to present your arguments and then your agreement or disagreement must be reflected in the last. So start analyzing, start examining point by point and conclude in the last whether you agree or you disagree. So avoid first person, avoid second person, use third person language always, use passive voice, do not start with yes or no, do not reveal your cards in the beginning itself. Your understanding must be reflected through your arguments, through your evidences, and then conclusions should be to indicate whether you have accepted or you have rejected, whether you accept in degrees or you reject the answer or the issue raised in question in degrees. When to use headings and subheadings? Sometimes questions have two, three or more parts. So when questions have multiple parts, use headings or subheadings to differentiate. If you do not use headings or subheadings, then examiner cannot really find out where your part number one is getting over and when are you starting part number two. So use Headings and subheadings in questions which have multiple parts. Whether you should use point format or you should use paragraph format, that also is a very important concept, idea you have to have. So a mix of paragraph and point format is the best way. Start your introduction with a paragraph format without putting any point. And then when you come to the main body, main body put in points and then conclude with a small paragraph of two to three sentences. So mix of paragraph and point form. What is point form? So when you're writing the features, then you can put number one feature, number two feature, number three feature, number four feature, number five, number six. Sometimes you may have 15, 16, 17 or 18 features, 18 points with you. So you can put one, two, three, four, five, or you can put bullets. Okay, first bullet, second bullet, third bullet, fourth bullet. As per your kind of understanding, as per your feeling, you have to use. The moment you put bullets or you put point numbers, you make your answer discrete. It's easy to comprehend. In GS answers, you must always use points or bullets as much as possible. In optional, you can use paragraphs, but in GS, paragraphs should be avoided because GS answers are not checked by the expert of the subject. They are checked by somebody who has a model answer format in front of him or her. 
So the examiner is going to match how many points of the model answer you have covered in your answer. So matching will decide your answers. Optional papers are checked by the subject expert. So even if you do not use the points you use paragraph, the examiner can understand okay, whether you have the understanding of the subject or not. But try to use points as much as possible. You can use one, two, three, four, or you can use bullets. So mix of both. Second thing you need to keep in your mind that all the points you need to cover, where the answer is of 150 words, whether it is of 225 words, all the points have to be included. As I told you in the beginning, cut down explanation, cut down supporting evidence, but include the points, include the key words, say liberal, progressive. Your language has to be technical language, mature language. So liberal, progressive, say democratic, say egalitarian. So these kind of words have to be part of your vocabulary. And those words you have to use repeatedly. So language has to be mature language. Language has to be technical language. Technical does not mean that history is not a technical subject. Every subject has its own vocabulary. So you must use the vocabulary of history while writing history answers. You must use the vocabulary of geography while writing geography answers. Similarly, you must use the vocabulary of constitution or polity when you go for those components of your GS papers. Let us take the example here. Account for the emergence of left wing within the Congress. This is one part. Second part says, how far did it influence the program and policy of Congress? So this question has two parts. And you must put headings here. You start introduction. The decade of 1920s witnessed the emergence of new ideologies in India and in India's struggle against British rule. The emergence of left wing was one of the most defining feature of this decade or the decades of 20s and 30s. After writing a brief introduction, then come to factors responsible for the emergence. Write all the factors, account for the rise. What account means? Tell us what were the factors responsible. Why did left wing emerge in Congress during 1920s, 30s? And then after completing that, come to the part number two or the second part of the demand. How far did influence? So influence or you can see impact of emergence of left wing on Congress. Then you can write all the dimensions of impact one by one. So put headings and subheadings when your question has two or more parts to differentiate. Okay, this is part number one, this is part number two, this is part number three. At times you may have even four or five parts in your answer or as for the demand of your question. Now coming to the issue of tail words, prefix, suffix. There are 40 to 45 varieties of these tail words. You must know what is the meaning of that. You must understand how the tail words are going to influence your language, your focus, Without meeting the demands of these tail words or suffixes, prefixes, your answers can never be effective. Let us see these tail words one by one. The first group is of comment. Comment critically. Do you agree with this statement? Give your views. All of these are quite similar. Comment means give your views. Or what do you think of? Do you agree? Do you disagree? In simple language, you have to express your opinion. Now this opinion is not your personal opinion. Okay, I have been taught Mahatma Gandhi he was a great leader. He is the father of nation. He 
played the most important role in India's struggle against British rule. And then you say, no, no, I know privately Gandhi was not a person of morality. He was something bad or people have written very, very wrong things about him. So don't put your private idea, something that you have read on WhatsApp or Facebook or Twitter, that is not supposed to be your opinion. It's not your personal opinion. Of course, your personal opinion and your professional opinion both have to be the same. But at times, if they are not the same, keep your personal opinion personal, private. Don't discuss that with anybody. In public life, you have to have a mature opinion. An opinion here means a standard, a valid, accepted by most. So something that is accepted by most scholars, most historians, something that is standard, something that is a valid opinion, something that you have learned during the preparation, that is your opinion, it's not your personal opinion. You have to believe what you have learned and what you have learned that has to be reflected in your answer sheet. Not something that you find somewhere in WhatsApp or somewhere in the internet. Internet is not going to give you guarantee that what you read is right or wrong, it's factually correct or it's incorrect. Internet is just a sum total of information. Information is not necessarily right or wrong. That is your decision. That's why the role of teacher comes into picture. Without guide, without teacher, you can never differentiate between right and wrong. And without right and wrong differentiation, you can never get wisdom. Without wisdom, you can never become successful. In public life, you can never crack civil services examination. So here, the role of mentor, the role of guide, the role of teacher is very, very important. That's how you form opinion, by discussing with your elders, by discussing with your teachers, by learning from somebody who has experience, by learning from somebody who has read a lot. So ensure that this is opinion. Opinion is not personal. It is standard, valid, accepted opinion by most scholars. When you say critically, critically will come repeatedly, critical examination, critical discussion. Critical means to what extent? So whenever you read the term critical or you get a prefix or suffix critical, you have to ask to what extent. So you have to operate in degrees. To what extent you agree? To what extent you disagree? To what extent it's positive? To what extent it's negative? To what extent it's short term? To what extent it's long term? To what extent it's good? To what extent it's bad? So depending on the requirements of question, you have to fulfill the needs of this phrase, to what extent? So when you say, give your views, so some things you may appreciate, some, some dimensions you may criticize. You may say, okay, this particular portion was good, or this particular policy of Gandhiji was good, but this policy was not that good. This was a positive impact of the activities of revolutionaries, but this impact was negative, was not good, was not beneficial. So you have to operate in degrees. You cannot have a blatant kind of, a kind of something, mono shade opinion. You have to understand degrees. You have to accept that there are different colors in white light. It's not just white, it will have all the colors. So you have to identify those different colors of agreement, of disagreement, of positive, so negative, short term, long term, good, bad, when you are asked to look critically. In UPS examination, critical understanding is the key to success. You have to reflect your critical understanding. It means you have to look at positives, you have to look at negatives, you have to have a positive orientation. But that does not mean that you close your eyes from the limitations of anything. So critical means to what extent that you have to understand. Write the uh, writings of philosophers had tremendous influence on the minds of people. This is an example of question which has a tailword of comment. 
Look at the question again. The writings of philosopher, this question is about French Revolution, had tremendous influence on the minds of people and created a revolutionary awakening in their minds and formed the intellectual creed of revolution comment. So give your opinion. It means write about the role of philosophers and write about their impact on the common Frenchman in spreading awareness. And then you can link that awareness with the outbreak of revolution. He is not talking about critical. This is question based on critical comment. If there would have been no Rousseau, there would have been no revolution. Comment critically. So once you have to comment critically, it means to what extent it is right to say. To what extent you agree, to what extent you disagree, that becomes important. And this extent could be zero versus 100. This extent could be 40 versus 60. Okay, 60% good, 40% not good, or 70% not good, 30% good. So you have to operate now degrees. So you have to say that philosophers like Rousseau played a very important role. But their role was that of a catalyst. Their role was indirect and remote. A revolution could have taken place in France even without these philosophers, maybe at a later date. So they brought the day of revolution nearer. So that's how you have to deal with critical comment, critical dimension of your question. Look at the third example here. The French Revolution of 1789 was not initiated by philosophers but by the mistakes of monarchy and the prevailing conditions. Do you agree with this statement? Pattern is similar, give your views. So you may agree, you may disagree, but don't start your answer, yes, I agree. It's done. That's not the reflection of your knowledge. Don't write, yes, no, I don't agree. And that's over. I've written, I don't agree. I don't need to write further. This is not about yes or no. This is about your understanding. So express your agreement partially, fully, on the basis of arguments, on the basis of evidences. Look at the next variety of prefixes. Discuss. Discuss critically. Discuss means different views. If you have different views, you can discuss. Discuss means different factors. Discuss the role of different factors. So which factor was responsible to what extent? Discuss the impact. So different dimensions. So when you are discussing, you are looking at different dimensions, basically. Dimensions of impact, dimensions of consequences, dimensions of factors, dimensions of immediate circumstances, dimensions of long-term circumstances. So they have to be multiple issues. And then you discuss, this is more important, this is important, this is least important. When you have discussion, you may conclude that, okay, this particular factor was more important or most important among these. And you may not conclude. So discussion means there are divergencies. And those divergencies you need to put in your answer. If you have only one dimension, you cannot discuss one dimension. So discussion will include multiple dimensions. All those things you need to write here when you discuss. And when you discuss critically, those different dimensions you have to highlight in terms of degrees. This factor was more important, this factor was least important. This impact was on social life, this impact was on economic life, this impact was on America, this impact was on the remaining part of the world. Depending on the needs of question, there will be divergencies. Look at here, discuss the economic and ideological significance. So, discussing what is economic significance? Economic significance could be for agriculture, for industries, for trade, for taxation, for currency. Ideological? Positive, negative, liberal, progressive, egalitarian, based on fraternity, based on constitutional values. What are the different ideologies? Write that. Different dimensions of economy, write that. So, different issues you need to highlight when you discuss. 
discuss critically the causes again different causes of French Revolution you need to write here social causes economic causes political causes religious causes role of philosophers role of American Revolution all those causes you need to write here so when you discuss something you'll have different dimensions amplify elaborate this is the next category amplify means make it bigger make it appear easily so make it bigger when you amplify something you do not change the constituents like suppose if I am speaking here and this amplifier is carrying the voice to you this amplifier cannot change my content what I am saying that has to be the same so amplification has to be hi-fi you see in electronics you get the term hi-fi high fidelity it should represent the true picture the original picture it means make it bigger by highlighting the different dimensions which may not be visible to a layman you have understood the subject you have the knowledge about subject so amplify the dimensions so that it becomes bigger it can be easily comprehended by everyone elaborate is similar elaborate means add more details you amplify but by adding more details in amplification you don't add details you make the available details bigger by providing more information here you add more details elaborate look at the questions here at different periods at different levels the national movement assumed social cultural economic dimensions so what are these economic dimensions which are not visible to a layman you need to write here how Swedish boycott how indigenous industries indigenous education all these things were highlighted social Hindu Muslim unity upliftment of women cultural nationalist music nationalist painting nationalist education nationalist literature all those things so cultural and so many things are hidden here which are not visible to a layman you have learned the subject you know what were these cultural dimensions please make them visible to me so amplify it make it bigger so that I could see these hidden things that's the meaning of amplification look at elaborate here Nehru's temples of modern India consisted not only of steel and power plants irrigation dams but included institutions of higher learning particularly in the scientific field elaborate so add more details it means these details are in terms of examples you are not changing the actual content you are just adding more details so that I could comprehend or everyone could comprehend what were these Nehruvian temples of modern India steel plants Bokaro, Bilai, Raurkela, Durgapur, Pop plants, Damodar Valley Corporation, you have Bhakra Nangal Dam, irrigation dams, institutions of higher learning UGC, IIT, scientific field ISRO, BARC, Indira Gandhi Center of Nuclear Research all those things which were continued so you have to write about those institutions so add details make it elaborate make it bigger so that everyone could understand what were these Nehruvian temples in reality temples means institutions here next category assess evaluate review so this category is going to look at finding truth you have to indulge in finding truth examine find out test it examine critically review again find the truth look at it is it right is it wrong is it acceptable is it not acceptable so you have to find out truth when you look at assessment or you evaluate you find out the merit here examine so meaning is the same or similar meaning of these different tail words 
let us take examples. Assess the importance of cholas in the history of South India. So you have to find out the importance of cholas in the history of South India. That could be administrative, that could be cultural, that could be economic, that could be in terms of imperialism. So find out the importance. Find out the truth about the importance of cholas. Evaluate. So judge the achievements of Pallavas. Look at the achievements and see whether they were good, they were bad, they were big or they were small. So you have to assess here, you have to find out the scale of these achievements. Critical review. Critical review means look into that. The impact of the French Revolution was initially confined to Europe, but that of Russian Revolution was global. So look at the issue, whether impact of French Revolution was up to France, where the impact of the Russian Revolution was on, on whole of the world. Review it. Find out the truth of this statement. So you have to indulge in finding truth, finding the reality. When you get the questions with tail words of examine, critically review, critically examine the relative significance, find out the relative significance. That's how you have to interpret. Of forces of coal and iron means economic factors. And the policy of blood and iron, that was the policy of Bismarck in the success of the process of German unification. So to what extent economic factors were important, to what extent Bismarckian radical nationalism was important, you have to f find out the degree of this truth. So examine, find out, look at this. Analyze, analyze critically. Analyze means Look at different dimensions in terms of significance, sometimes could be in terms of features, sometimes it could be in terms of impact, sometimes it could be in terms of relevance. So when you analyze, you look at different dimensions in terms of these. Analyze critically to what extent? So critically always to what extent? Good, bad, negative, positive, short term, long term. Accepted, rejected. So here to what extent it was significant, to what extent features, all these things. Look at the example here. Assess the causes, sorry, analyze the causes of Russian Revolution of 1917. So it means Analyze the economic causes. Analyze the political causes. Analyze the social causes. Analyze the role of external factors. So all these different dimensions you need to look at, that is analysis, looking at the issue from multiple angles, from multiple point of views, from multiple different kind of dimensions. Look at the second, critically analyze the factors and force responsible for First World War. So critical means to what extent, so here you need to see which factor was important to what extent. Maybe imperialism was important. But was it more important? Was it less important? Arms race, again to what extent? Alliances, military alliances to what extent? Radical nationalism to what extent? So look at these different dimensions. But in degrees, in terms of significance. So causes in terms of significance here, factors in terms of significance here, significance of these factors that you have to look at when you analyze. Elucidate, explain, elaborate, illustrate. Elucidate means make it simpler. Illustrate. 
you need to add examples. So give details in terms of examples. Elaborate, make it bigger as you discussed in the amplification. Quite similar. Explain. Explain means tell more about it. So all of these are similar to explain. Explain in simple language that is elucidate. Your language has to be simple, simplest possible terms. Simplicity requires very, very high level of knowledge, very, very high level of clarity. So, so your knowledge, explain in simpler language, explain with examples. So, tell more about this issue, but with the help of examples, make it bigger by adding more details. Look at the example here. The American Revolution was essentially an economic conflict between American capitalism and British mercantilism in you see it. So here, tell us more about this issue. Question is not asking whether you agree or you disagree, whether this is right or this is wrong. He's saying, tell us more. What was American capitalism? What was British mercantilism? And how both of those forces resulted in outbreak of American Revolution or commencement of American War of Independence. Look at the next example. American War of Independence inaugurated the age of revolutions. Explain. It means give examples. How American War of Revol Independence resulted in different revolutions. So show the link and give examples. In many ways, Lord Dalhousie was the founder of Modern India Elaborate. So tell us about the works of Lord Dalhousie. Those works in terms of railways, telegraph, in terms of political unification, in terms of social reforms. Those things you need to write here to indicate that Dalhoji was the founder of modern India in many ways. Look at the next example. Do you think that the economic measures introduced by the Sultanate rulers were beneficial to the common people as well? Illustrate. So what do you say? They were beneficial? Tell me examples. They were not beneficial? Tell me ex with example. So provide details with examples that is illustrate. Justify, support, substantiate. In these kind of questions you have to find supporting evidence. Supporting evidence. You have to prove it right. You have to give proof. And that is not contrary in proof, but supporting proof. So proof in support. Justify. Tell me why it is right. Prove it that you can support it. Don't oppose it. Support it. Substantiate it. So give details so that I could understand that you agree with this. Look at the example. Justify Pliny's statement that Rome was being drained out of its gold by India. So this is a question in terms of ancient India, the post-modern period when Indo-Roman trade was highly developed and huge amount of Roman wealth was moving into India because India was exporting kind of primary and secondary goods to Roman world. So justify. Tell me what was export. Tell me what was import. And that justification should reveal that Roman gold was moving into India. Indian primary and secondary products were going there. How justified are we? So critical ex comment kind of stuff here. In characterizing post modern five centuries as dark age. So to what extent it can be accepted? To what extent it's not acceptable? That you have to give reasons, provide evidence. So justification, whether degrees or the absolute, you have to justify with the help of evidence, corroboration or support. The Charter Act of 1833 rung, uh, rung down the curtain on the company's trade and introduced a new concept to government in India. Substantiate, provide the supporting evidence. How Charter Act of 1833 brought the curtains down on companies 
existence of company's monopoly. So when you say substantiate, you have no other option but to support it. You cannot say, no, no, it's not right. It is right and provide evidence in support of that. Highlight, throw light. So when you highlight something, when you throw light something, make it visible. Means it is invisible, it is kind of hidden, something that is hidden, something that is not visible, bring it out. So sometimes you may have a prefix bring out, highlight, meaning is the same. Look at examples. Highlight the achievements of Guptas. So bring out the achievements. So the achievements of Guptas in literature, science and mathematics. Or technology here. Throw light on the land revenue system. So tell us about different parts, causes, the features, the positives, negatives of land revenue system. What were the different systems? This is Mashahat system or Batai system or Ijaradari system. Tell me about it different land revenue systems. Critical and comparative account. So compare two or more things and find out similarities, find out differences, but critical in terms of degrees. To what extent they were similar, to what extent were they different, that is critical in comparative account. Look at the example here. Furnish a critical in comparative account of various schools of art. So Mathura School of Art, Gandhara School of Art, Amravati School of Art. These schools of art flourished in India during post-modern period. To what extent they were similar? To what extent there were differences? Uh, they were different. So put all those dimensions. So what essay? So essay means write about causes Write about impact, write about kind of other details. So when you write essay, you meet the needs of when, what, how, by whom, impact positive, negative. So essay will include all these things without being judgmental. Write a short essay on the development of literature during Mughal period. So write about the literature. Literature means Persian literature, Turkish literature, Hindi Sanskrit literature, by court or by private. All these things you need to add here. Write everything that you know that is essay. The last example of prefix here, in the light of this statement. In light of this statement means your focus has to be limited to the issues covered in a statement. You have to answer your question within the boundaries of this statement. Look at this. Despite the fact that Muslims and Hindus fought against British in the revolt of 57, a separatist movement started soon after resulting in the partition of India. This is the boundary. This is the statement. In the light of this statement, discuss briefly the origin and development of Muslim separatist movement, which culminated in the creation of Pakistan. So tell us about the unity that was there between Hindus and Muslims in the revolt of 57, and what happened thereafter, how separatist movement emerged, and how did this movement result in partition of India. So your boundaries have been defined by this statement. You don't have to go outside it. You have to be within it. That's the meaning of in the light of this statement. So this is about answer writing. I hope this session will help you in writing high quality answers. In case of any doubt, difficulty, always feel free to contact me through teacher support. And I'm always here to help you. So keep learning, keep revising, keep practicing every day. All the best. May God bless you.